Welcome to the Interesting Podcast with Jedi Brian number 28. Now this episode, I hope you're sitting down because it's kind of a big deal. This episode is one of my favorite authors of all time, Mr. John Jackson Miller. And you know I talk about Star Wars on this podcast a lot, so you probably know who that is. He wrote Kenobi, he wrote A New Dawn, the Knights of the Old Republic comic series, that's him. He's written Halo books, Mass Effect books, he's got a new trilogy out, uh, that's Star Trek, that sounds amazing, definitely check that out. Uh, but yeah, this was this was super, super fun. Uh, we talk about how he got his start working on comics, he's worked for Marvel and Dark Horse, which is crazy. Um, he's got a massive, massive collection. Um, we talk about how he made the jump from writing comics to writing prose. Um, he has some great advice for writers uh, toward the end of this one. Also, be sure to check out his website, farawaypress.com, because he has entries that are like behind the scenes of things that he's written, a whole lot of extra tidbits and trivia. and It's super cool. It's super cool. Um, almost as cool as the man himself. So without further ado... Please enjoy episode number 28 of the Interesting Podcast with New York Times best-selling author, John Jackson Miller. Roll the theme song. Hello, John. Hey, how's it going? Uh, great. How are you? I'm uh, great. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Right on. Right on. I just got this new mic set up, and I uh, wasn't sure how it worked yet. And it works, okay. so you can hear me. So, hey, we're okay. already off to a good start. All right. How are you? Uh, I'm all right. Good, good. You're central time, so that is not north, technically. Uh, it's what's well, west. It's uh, well, well, west and north because I'm in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, yeah. I have not. Is it cold there right now? Uh, yeah, it's about thirty degrees. Oh, I live in Florida, and yeah, last night we hit forty-eight, and it <laughs> felt like we were all gonna die. Well, I'll be there in about three weeks, so hopefully it will be uh <laughs> still, <laughs> yeah. still warmer. Yeah, keep keep that cold to yourself. Yeah, I'll try to do that. <laughs> well, first and foremost, thank you so much for your time. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Sure thing. Um, but, yeah, so I won't waste any time. I got a lot of questions. Okay. And people submitted them, and I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. So if I geek out on you a little bit, no, it's all right. my bad. <laughs> no, it's not a problem. Um, so you, you write comics. I have done quite a lot of that, yeah. A lot of comics. Yeah, not uh, not as many as, as some people, but <laughs> of course, of course. But you worked. I mean, you did. You've done Marvel. You've done work for Dark Horse. That's yeah. that's pretty intense. How did a uh, uh, actually? You know, I like I like to start at the beginning. When did you know you wanted to be a writer? Uh, well, I I never really knew anything else because, uh, you know, I started. You know, books were always in my house as a kid. Uh, my mother was a grade school librarian uh and so you know i started getting comics when i was six years old and you know she didn't throw my comics away like some people's parents she actually you know suggested that i keep them in good shape and put them in order and uh so i i still have everything that i ever had from way back then really? uh and around the same time i started uh drawing my own comics under sort of the miller comics imprint uh you know sort of making my own, uh, you know, comics universe, uh, that continued to develop through the years. Uh, and you know, I started writing my own, uh, you know, my own novel series, so to speak, or short story series, uh, with my old typewriter, uh, you know, back as a kid. Sure. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I got to, uh, high school and, uh, we had a photocopier by that point And, I discovered that there was this network of people that were uh, buying, selling, you know, exchanging, um, you know, mini comics that they were producing 
uh, through the mail. Uh, and so I joined that community and started you know, publishing for real, more or less. Right. Uh, and of course, this is all stuff that nowadays, if you were to do it, you would have uh, a webcomic or, uh, or instead of a fanzine, you might have a, a blog. Sure, uh, sure. we, we use what we had. So anyway, uh, so I did that and continued to do some of that work, uh, on into college. Uh, went to journalism school, uh, for college, uh, you know, became the editor of my campus newspaper at Tennessee. Um, you know, then, uh, after a side trip, uh, into, uh, Soviet studies, uh, in grad school, uh, continued to work in uh, in journalism. Uh, you know, my first job was editing magazines about lumber, which was not very exciting. <laughs> uh, but that gave me a chance to uh, get uh, a, a job working for uh, the company that does Comics Buyer's Guide. Uh, and right. so I, that's when I moved to Wisconsin. I've been uh, here ever since. Uh, but I spent about a decade as the... Uh, well, I started just as the editor of the trade magazine for the comics industry called Comics Retailer, uh, but I, uh, you know, branched out, uh, became the editorial director, you know, first of Comics Buyer's Guide, which was our newspaper, uh, our, our consumer magazine. Uh, you know, then uh, added some other magazines to, uh, you know, sort of my my department. Uh, I was the editor for Scry Magazine, which was the card game, collectible card game magazine for things like uh, Magic and uh, and Pokemon. Sure. Uh, and uh, and you know then also edited uh, you know books, uh, price guides uh, for for you know comics and uh, trading card games that sort of thing. Uh, and even though I you know sort of left that behind uh, some years ago, I still do. Uh, follow that business, um, and I continue to uh, publish, uh, you know, sales figures that I've, uh, you know, generated. I I just passed 20 years of doing monthly sales reports wow. uh, on uh, on the comics industry, uh, and I publish those on a website of mine called Comicron, uh, right. and so and so I've I've been doing that, uh, you know, that that's more on the side now. Um, uh, but having you know, gotten all that work in the comics uh, you know, side of things on the on the you know on the journalistic side, uh, I had met people in the business. Um, you know, I, I probably had a unique kind of window to be able to talk to people. Um, that led to me getting to you know do sort of my demo reel for Marvel, um, sure. and that that was published as a comic book called Crimson Dynamo. Uh, that was followed up with by me doing a year on Iron Man, and you know then you know literally I just dropped by at Dark Horse one day. Uh, I, well, it wasn't quite like that. I, I was uh, out in uh, in Portland um, for a family reunion, and again I knew people at the company, and I was you know suggested, hey, I'd like to come out for a tour. And while I was there, uh, you know I happened to spot that uh, that Randy Stradley was in the office. Uh, and, uh, you know, dropped by to chat with him and he suggested that they had, uh, you, you know, a, an opening on, uh, one of the star Wars titles. Uh, I wrote a proposal for that book that turned into the first story I wrote for star Wars. Right. And then the, the thing that followed that was the Knights of the old Republic comic series. And basically after that, you know, all, all the other doors kind of open following that. Uh, and I've worked not just in star Wars, uh, not just in comics, but in in prose, not just in Star Wars, but Mass Effect, uh, Simpsons, uh, Conan, and now, uh, you know, most recently this year, uh, you know, I've done obviously a lot with Star Trek. I have a, a trilogy coming out this this fall, right? And uh, and then uh, I, I I did a couple of Halo books that came out, including one that just came out this past week, uh, and I, I'm even in a, in a uh, Planet of the Apes book, which is coming out in January. That is amazing. It's also super cool that, like you said, like a lot of kids back when, you know, their moms did just throw away their comics. You know, they'd go away and whatever, and their mom just threw away. So it's pretty amazing that your mom kind of got you started in collecting, like properly yeah. collecting. Well, I, but I don't think she thought of it as collecting. I think she thought of it as, well, we're going to keep it a library. Sure. Uh, it's, <laughs> oh, yeah, because she's a librarian. That's amazing. 
And you know, we uh, you know, certainly, certainly, you know, your, your your folks spend money on these things, so they they probably would think it's a good idea to hang on to yeah, them. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> they don't want to see money that they've spent just go in the trash. That's what I would think. Yeah. Uh, what was your favorite comics growing up? Oh gosh, well that would be. Uh, it depends on the year. I mean, the the, the first point. three or four years, uh, you know, when I was in elementary school, you know, I was reading, you know, Richie Rich and, and Uncle Scrooge and Pink Panther and those kind of things. Sure. Uh, yeah, my, uh, probably my favorite stuff either would have been, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Uncle Scrooge comics by, uh, Carl Barks. Uh, and that incidentally is the origin of, uh, you know, uh, my, my website is and my, and my studio is called Far Away Press. Right. Uh, and I'm JJM Far Away on Twitter. A lot of people think that the Far Away actually came from Star Wars. Right. Actually, it predated that. Um, you know, I I had uh, that was actually uh, it came from the 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 uh, the uh, the Uncle Scrooge comics of Carl Barks. Really? Uh, and yeah, and uh, and so you know, I had a, uh, a comic strip called Far Away Looks for some time, uh, and uh, that. Uh, you know, predated a lot of this other stuff. And, uh, and, uh, that was, that was actually, uh, you know, what I was working on when I, uh, you know, got in touch with Marvel. I had just done my, uh, you know, the first collection of those comic strips, uh, that, that I had done. That was back when I thought I could draw. I don't even try now. <laughs> um, but, uh, you just use your words but, now, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, so that was probably the, my favorite stuff early on. Um, sure. You know, then, uh, you know, Star Wars, the first sort of grown up comic book I got was Star Wars number one when the when the movie came out. Right. Uh, and, you know, I, I, from thereafter, I was into, uh, well, the, the main Star Wars title, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, also, I, I was big on Amazing Spider-Man uh, sure. and uh, uh, also, you know, a little later than that, uh, X-Men. Uh, and and I was pretty much a Marvel guy. Right. Uh, but I, I did read. Uh, you know, Teen Titans and and some of those other you know DC books, uh, and uh, I also read a lot of uh, independent books. I was uh, I was big on uh, you know Cerebus, uh, the Aardvark. That was uh, that was one of the longest running independent titles ever. Right. Uh, uh, ran 300 issues, wow. and, and just a whole variety of of different you know things. And uh, uh, you know, of course, once we get to the years where I'm editing the the magazine. Uh, I'm getting free comics from everybody. So oh, right. <laughs> you 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 figured out a way to get into the jackpot career choice for you. Well, you, you know, comics and then get into the industry and then get free comics. It's pretty great. Well, people 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 think that's a cool thing, but what they don't understand is, you know, uh, you know, having you know, twenty comics uh, is, is a fun weekend. <laughs> uh, having having twenty thousand, or in my case, you know, upwards of forty thousand. Uh, you know, that's that's a that's a job for a, a home interior specialist. Sure. <laughs> uh, um, I, I have actually had to have an engineer come out and look at the floor underneath my library to make sure that the comics don't crash in down on my car. That is so, amazing. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, books are heavy. So, uh, yeah, ab uh, absolutely. And comics, when you add them up, it's still it adds weight. And, you know, when you think about it, uh, I think I calculated once it was costing something like 25 cents to store every one of those free comics. <laughs> so it, so it, they weren't exactly free in the long run. Sure, sure. That is crazy. 40,000. That is, that is a respectable number. So, uh, yeah, you can you do the math and figure out how much it has probably cost to, uh, to you know, store all this stuff over the years. Sure, sure. You're like the Rancho Obi-Wan of comics. Uh, not even, not, not even close. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many people with much, much larger collections, uh, you know, including some, you know, friends of mine here locally, uh, you know, that I used to work with. So it's, uh, really? uh it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's fairly easy to, to, to roll up a pretty big uh, collection. So it's, uh, uh, just by, you know, well, what happened with me was all the other kids in high school, you know, that had collected comics in middle school, uh, they all dropped out of comics. And I said, great. Can I have your stuff? Uh. Um, and and I did that for for comics. I did it for Dungeons and Dragons. I did it for video games. Uh, you know, uh, suddenly all these things as they became uncool. Uh, and of course, I, I you know I don't think comics will ever be uncool again. But for real, <laughs> you know, back ba back in the day, there was a you know there was certainly a, a you know a sort of a, a stigma to them. For sure. Uh, 
and uh, so I would just absorb collections left and right. I mean, I've, I've, I have my old, uh, I used to keep notes on everything, you know, it's sort of like my own list of, as, as comic books ended up being added to my collection, I would write them in the book and I would say what day it was and where I got them and everything. Uh, and, you know, there's days I remember, like, you know, I can, I can tell you now, uh, March 5th, 1983, that was when I got Jason Coleman's collection. Uh, and <laughs> that was about 600 comic books, uh, you know, most of them, uh, you know, uh, Marvel books from uh, from the 70s. So it was, uh, you, you know, I'm sure, and I don't think I gave him, like, much of anything for him. So it's... Right. That's so anyway. awesome. That, yeah. That's very, very smart. I, I didn't think about that. If you have friends that have them and then they get out of them, cash in, man. That's yeah, awesome. yeah. So you – and. Yeah, that will on. probably that will probably never happen again now that we've got you know uh, ebooks and that sort of thing digital Good you point. know stuff so it, it, it's much less of a burden to hold on to that stuff sure sure now like it's like you said everything's online now like DeviantArt and Imgur and you can just make these things and put them out without having to go through a publisher now and things yep. like that um so that's pretty crazy you you did you basically did a demo reel for yourself and got a job at Marvel what was it like writing Iron Man? Because it's kind of well, a big deal. That was uh, that was fun. You know, they kind of positioned me uh, or marketed me as as like sort of this Tom Clancy for comics. Uh, <laughs> because what I tried to do was, um, I did uh, I did Tony Stark become Secretary of State, uh, not Secretary Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Defense. Right. Uh, even I, even the, they, you know, they they've gotten that wrong on the backs of covers before even i just now got it wrong uh it, it well it's been 12 years um sure i i made him secretary of defense and so this sort of predates the civil war stuff by a couple of years uh and uh it kind of took it was a post 9 11 story that took tony stark back to the days in the 60s when he was involved with the military right uh and so he was looking for a way to get involved on his own terms uh, and so we published, uh, we published all of that. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was, it, it was fun because I was able to draw on a lot of different eras of the series because I had all of those comics, uh, all the way back to the very beginning. Right. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I would, that was, a, that was when I started doing the, the, the notes that I do on my website on farawaypress.com where, you know, I'll say, here's where we got this character from. Here's where we got that character from. Uh, and you know, this is from the sixties, this is from the seventies. Uh, but at the same time, I was also making sure that everything that I did, uh, was based in reality in some sense, sure. uh, cause there was all this military equipment in it. So that was another thing that I did on the website is, you know, Hey, here's, here's what, uh, here are all the actual military vehicles that we used as models, you know, where I set the information to the artist. Uh, you know, to to design these things, um, and you know, I you know ended up going to a friend of mine who worked with uh, uh, he, he worked in Air Force public relations uh, to get uh, some information about uh, you know what one of the uh, big transport planes looked like on the inside. Sure. Uh, and and so you know, I was able to provide all this stuff uh, to the artist, and you know, a, a good a goodly amount of it got through and that's that's uh one of the reasons that I keep the site is sort of you know here, you know this is like the footnotes uh right. is further reading for sure for sure you were involved in one of my favorite comic series uh the disassembled storylines uh that was it yeah disassembled uh I wrote the disassembled prelude um and what happened there was I actually had a completely different plan going uh for the comic series and then they came along and said well we're probably going to do something in the summer uh instead uh where we're going to do an annual crossover and it might be you know they were talking about atlantis attacks two or something like that at that sure. point and so and so i came up with a completely different plot line uh and then they came back and they said well, we're sorry to tell you, but we've decided to give the entire universe to Brian Michael Bendis next year, and and at the same time, we're going to give your book to uh, what well, wasn't really my book, but we're going to give Iron Man to Warren Ellis, uh, and he's going to do the Extremist series. And if you could take two issues to wrap up your storyline in such a way that it will tie into the beginning of Avengers Disassembled, and 
uh, that ended up becoming, uh, you know, that story arc that I wrote at the very end there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was a, it was a decent little, uh, you know, story arc and it, it was a, it was a good run. I mean, I got to write all the Avengers pretty much in that last, uh, story I did. Uh, and that actually is the only portion of my run, uh, that is available in print, uh, reprint because, uh, while it's all on marvel.com, uh, none of the, uh, earlier books have, you know, turned up in reprint yet because I guess they're just not old enough, uh, right. to, uh, and, but the, but the Avengers disassembled stuff is, uh, still in print. Uh, you know, what nobody can find is Crimson Dynamo. That was something where I did that on a different contract than everything else at Marvel because it was part of a line called Epic. Uh, and none of the Epic stuff is on Marvel.com. Uh, uh-huh. and so, you know, I, I would like to talk with them eventually, but getting that you know, back available because that was also a good little story. It just wasn't, you know, intended to be anything like a blockbuster. Sure. Sure. I have, a. you've done cons multiple times and whatnot, and you see a lot of the indie comics as well. And I was amazed at how much work goes into a comic book and oh, yeah. going the indie route. Like you're, you're responsible for literally all of it. Like it's not going anywhere unless you forcibly make it into something and then push it. Uh, well, that is uh, that is actually what Crimson Dynamo was. The right. the epic the epic line was the idea was we're going to hire outside people to do, you know, a, a number of comics. And what I did was yeah, I, I I pitched my my series proposal, but then they came back to me and they said, okay, we need you to actually assemble a team, uh, artists, colorists, letterers, and you know, deliver the files. Right. Uh, and that was beyond me. So I, I went and got a friend of mine, uh, Mark Patton, who had a, has a company called Destination Entertainment, uh, and he does packaging on, uh, on, uh, on you know, books and that sort of thing. And he went out and he found everybody and he hired everybody. And, <laughs> he, he, and, and you know, I just, I just signed the checks. So right. He was the Nick Fury of your group. <laughs> that was, and that was, that was necessary because I really needed to focus my attentions on the writing uh, and, you know, I'll be honest, that's one of the reasons why I have been slower to get my own intellectual property out in terms of a comic, mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, that you know, if I were to do a comic book for image, that would be the same way. It would be right. it would be the same same deal where I'd have to do, you know, all of the stuff involved with getting it ready. Uh, and once again, you know, I'm just not sure that's the best use of my time. Sure, sure, absolutely. It, it's a ton of work. Um, so how how does that differ from working for Marvel? Like, what what well, is the day in and day out like? Well, uh, w- when you're when you're working for the publisher, where the publisher is actually hiring the artist and everything else, mm-hmm. uh, well, obviously that's much easier right there. Uh, it it then just becomes a matter of uh, you know, if you're just working on something like a Marvel book where you're talking to just the editor who runs things or Simpsons, where it's just the editor who runs the Simpsons comics, you know, then it doesn't have to go through a third party. Uh, and it's a little bit more streamlined. If you're working star Wars, uh, or, um, you know, star Trek or mass effect or halo or something like that. Sure. Well, then it's got to be sent on to the people who own the license to approve whatever is going on. And that uh, experience can either be easy or hard. And, uh, you know, there are uh, there are some companies that are really easy to work with. Um, and you know, Star Wars, that's obviously one of them because I work with them frequently. Sure. Uh, and then there are other ones that tend to be more, you know, for various reasons. It just is more problematic. Right. right. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, those tend to be the ones that you don't continue working with uh, or don't work with as much. And uh, and so, uh, but uh, but again, you know, it's the price you pay for working in somebody else's sandbox. Of course. Uh, so so yeah, there's a different workflow there. And what will happen is, you know, they will either give you, depending on the company, they will either give you a lot of opportunity to, uh, you know, see what's happening behind the scenes, mm-hmm. or not much at all. Um, gotcha. You know, I I you know Star Wars, it was yeah you know, the case that I would frequently get. Uh, you know, they'd send me the, they, they would send me the, uh, you know, the finished pages, uh, as they were lettering them and they would suggest, uh, Hey, is there anything, you know, that's, that's different or you know, anything in the art that needs to be explained in the text. And I would, I would have the chance to do that. 
But then there were a lot of times uh, where, because of deadlines or just because of you know, how the editors were working things, uh, that you know I didn't get that chance. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, you know, here's an example. Um, you know, the 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 Halo uh, story I just did, which came out Wednesday uh, in uh, in a book called uh, Halo: Tales from Slip Space. Uh, you know, I wrote that thing a year ago, mm-hmm. uh, and the first I saw of any of the art. Uh, was when the book arrived in my house last week. Uh, so, <laughs> wow. So, you know, well, the good news is it, it was all fine. It, sure. and it looks good. Uh, but but again, you know, you just you you learn to be uh, aware that your process is going to vary uh, from month to month, even uh, depending on what's going on. Um, sure. And uh, and who they're working with and how many other people they're working with. I'm pretty sure the situation on Halo was, uh, you know, there's eight different comics artists, uh, eight, eight, eight different writers in that anthology. Uh, right. So, you know, sending everything out to everybody would probably take forever. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, what were the biggest differences between working for Marvel and Dark Horse, if there were any? Well, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Marvel uh, is one of those things where, uh, that was an ongoing series that I was I was dropped into as far as Iron Man was concerned. Right. Uh, uh, you know, I did have a single issue of Star Wars Empire, uh, but that title was already you know on the way out. Uh, I think they did one more story arc after uh, after my you know, single issue, uh, so it wasn't something where uh, I was trying to get on a moving train. Right. Uh, uh, where I was trying to actually filter myself into something. I mean, that that was what had to happen with Iron Man. I had to figure out, well, what has just happened in the last few issues by uh, by uh, by the other guy? And, and in, in that case, it was Frank Thierry. Uh, you know, I, I needed to go back and get those issues and see what he had done. Uh, and, of course, those issues hadn't been published yet by the time I, I got the, uh, the uh, you know, by the time I was writing. Right. Uh, so I, I had to get as much information as I could uh, you know, from the editor about what else was happening. You know, Knights of the Old Republic, you know, I started that from ground zero. Right, um, right. You know, and and you're right there from the beginning. And so it was not the case where, uh, you know, I needed to go worry about the story so far. Um, I, I, I'm certain it would be the case where, you know, if I were writing something that were in a different part of the timeline, um, yeah, there would have been a lot more conversations, For sure. uh, but, uh, but, you know, I was blessed over there that a lot of the stuff that I did, uh, all three series that I did were well away from, um, you know, other stuff going on. Sure, sure. Um, the only thing I had to worry about with Knights of the Old Republic was, uh, you know, we had the video game series coming up before too long, right, uh, right. yes, five or six years later, but you know, that was, that was still a good ways off. For sure, and actually, that's a great segue. I love Knights of the Old Republic comic series. You did oh, su- such a good job. Every time I pump gas, I think of Griff. <laughs> every yeah. every single time, I was what, like, if someone... why 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 pumping gas? Because in one, I think it's the first issue when he steals the ship from the fueling station, and there's no gas in it. Oh yeah. And I was like, that is such a perfect like comedic tool to be like, oh, I stole a ship before they put gas in it. And I yeah, just remember I can't, laughing so hard. To or whatever, pump. whatever the uh, yeah, whatever that was. Yeah, yeah I just I, I I I can't I can't remember, but yeah, it's it's uh, well, I, I worry about little logistical things like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that that was uh, that was a fun series, and the, you know the nice thing about it is you know Marvel uh, brought back the uh, the books in uh, the epic collection yes. that they've done. Uh, the first one is the first eighteen issues plus issue zero. Uh, the second one comes out in March, uh, and that's the next, uh, you know, 19 issues, uh, plus the handbook, which has never been reprinted. Uh, and, uh, and you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's awesome. And also they went back and they grabbed the, um, they grabbed the, the, uh, text pages that I did, uh, in the second year of the series. So, uh, that was, uh, now, now finally there'll be a way to get all three or just, you know, you get those three books and you have everything. Sure. Sure. Uh, as the creator of Knights of the Old Republic, 
how much say did you have on the design of the characters? Because like the Jedi uh, Master had elaborate tunics and look great. Zane Carrick has a very specific look about him. Like, well, all the vi- all the visuals came from Brian Ching. Uh, you know, yeah. I made some suggestions. Right. Uh, you know, I you know I totally endorsed you know just about every decision he made. I can't remember. Uh, I, you know, in fact, he he sent me in a different direction. Uh, you mentioned Griff. Yeah. Uh, you know, Griff was originally going to be an Ortolan. Uh, really? You know, a you know yeah, one of those little blue elephant Max Rebo guys. Yeah. Uh, and he said, I can't do this because he has no mouth. Um, Good point. And and we won't be able to see any expressions. Uh, he has no eyebrows either. So, <laughs> uh, so he so he he pointed me the other direction. He said, "Let's go with with this." Yeah. In the meantime, you know, he came up with a a vision for Jarrell that was great. Yeah. It was it wasn't, however, what other members of her species look like. Uh, and I said, "You know what? The heck with it. We'll make that a plot element." Uh, and we ended up getting three different stories out of the fact that she doesn't look like other Arcanians. Right. That is so cool to have like people that are both creative and mesh. And then the result is great for everyone. Cause Gr- yeah, Griff I'm, is such a cool design as well. And you know, when you have time, that also helps. Of, uh, of you know, we, uh, I think I turned in that first script about 11 months before the, the first issue came out. So there was a lot of time, <laughs> uh, it it still was not enough time because we ended up having a fill in artist in the first uh, six months, right. and that's always sort of been, uh, you know, the one little, you know, not not that the art was bad, but it which was just different. Uh, in that first story arc, uh, you know, you you have uh, four issues of of one artist and then one issue of another and then one issue of the original artist again. So you try to avoid that whenever possible. Uh, but again, that was my fault because I dropped issue zero on them, uh, <laughs> and there wasn't originally going to be an issue zero. And right. we thought, well, we we needed to have Brian draw issue zero, so uh, yeah, he ended up getting pulled off of uh, our our own book uh, to do this <laughs> other book. So that's amazing. Uh, Zane Carrick, super cool name. How do you keep naming these things with such cool names? Zane felt like a, uh, you know, it, it was a Western name, obviously Zane Gray, uh, right. Western author. Uh, also, you know, by by putting the Y in there, I kind of do that always anyway, just to make it a little bit less earthly. But but the thought the thought also is, you know, Zane is is like one letter away from Zany. He's, he's somebody that you maybe can't take too seriously. Right. Uh, uh, Carrick was uh, was the name of my dormitory uh, in wow. at, at college. Uh, I did that twice. Uh, Carrick Hall was where I lived for most of uh, most of my undergraduate years, uh, uh, and then for a small time I was living in uh, a, a, uh, a an apartment complex called Holt H O L T. That became Kara Holt's last name. Ah. Uh, and uh, and yeah, actually it's kind of sad because uh, Carrick Hall is spe- scheduled to be demolished next summer. So oh no. Uh, and and Holt Hall has already been demolished, so uh, they're replacing it with something new, and hopefully with cable TV because we didn't have cable. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, Kara, that's another one where, you know, uh, Kara is actually a contraction for Knight Errant, K E R R A. Oh wow! It was a placeholder name that I put in there so I could go ahead and start writing, and I just said, you know what, I like the sound of it. Let's let's keep it. So. Yeah, sometimes it's no more, uh, you know, no more fancy than something like that. Sure, but that's a deep dive to previous works. So that's that's really cool. I never knew that. Yeah, it's uh, uh, that's one of those things that people can find out on FarawayPress.com because I've got these trivia pages on every issue that I've ever done. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so. Working in comics for so long, what made you want to move over to writing novels? Uh, well, I guess because you know my day job was was writing uh, in right. prose. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd been a journalist, and uh, I you know I had always wanted to um, you know to try my hand at it. Uh, and yeah, you know, starting at Star Wars is really kind of starting at the top, the same way that starting with Marvel is kind of starting at the top. Good point for comics. Uh, you know, my, my route is not usually going to be something anybody else is going to be able to do. Uh, it, it was it was a one time kind of a thing sure. uh, that I, I really lucked out that I had those relationships. Uh, but, you know, what happened was I kept wanting to get some fiction into Star Wars Insider. Ah. 
Uh, uh, in, in, Insider was going through some changes at the time, and they didn't run any fiction for a good couple of years. Right. Uh, but, um, but they were doing uh, fiction over on hyperspace, uh, and I remember that hyperspace. Was, that was the uh, that was sort of the paywall area behind uh, StarWars.com, yep. and that was being run by Pablo Hidalgo. Uh, and uh, Pablo hired me to do uh, a short story that tied in with uh, Knights of the Old Republic, and uh, then I did another one, and you know, then I did a few more, and uh, then I was connected. Uh, you know, my my uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the fiction editor at Lucasfilm uh, connected me with uh, uh, Shelley Shapiro at Del Rey when they needed some short stories done for the promotion of fate of the Jedi. Right. Uh, and that led to me doing, uh, these eight short stories that appeared for free online over the course of the first, uh, three years. Um, well, what, what it was the three years during which they were releasing the fate of the Jedi novels. Uh, and that was lost tribe of the Sith. And, right. uh, and you know, those books, uh, it's, it's those little eBooks. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting. You can't really tell so much anymore, but in the beginning, yeah, you could follow along from book one to book two to book three, uh, or story one, story two, story three, and you could see my craft getting better. Right. Uh, because uh, literally about five months was were passing in between each story, and I was writing a lot of other stuff in the meantime. Uh, so you know the 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 very first thing, which is the thing that most people saw first, was probably the worst. But uh, which is uh, unfortunate. But uh, but then what happened is when we collected it um, and we added uh, you know an additional novella to it, uh, I went back and I I re-edited uh, you know the original stories. So hopefully the you know the when when people are getting the uh, the uh, the collected edition, uh, they're getting a much better. Uh, and and a, a more coherent book, uh, and it must be working because that book's on the twelfth printing. Yeah, <laughs> you're doing something right. Uh -huh. Yeah, consider, considering that all those stories, or at least eight of those stories, you know, were available for free. Yeah, and uh, you know, we did a million downloads on these things, so it's uh, it, you know, that's 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 nice. Yeah, uh, that's amazing. Pay for it. Absolutely. Um, when you're writing novels to writing comics, do you approach it differently? Between writing the two uh, mediums, yeah, I think you have to. I mean, ob obviously, uh, uh, there are tools that you just don't have uh, in comics, in in the sense that, uh, you know, you uh, a lot of things that we used to use when I was a, a kid, like thought balloons, are gone. Right. Uh, you know, I don't use a lot of narrative captions, uh, where the the narrator is in there all the time you know, piping in with, with details and, and stuff like that. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 so I have, I have that kind of to, to, uh, be part of my toolkit in prose because I can say what characters are thinking a lot more often. I can get into a lot more detail about, uh, you know, some things that are less visual. Um, at the same time, you know, it's on me in the novels to, uh, tell you know people what characters look like and everything. What I found is that the more I'm writing, the less and less of that kind of description uh, I'm I'm doing. Um, really? You know, I, I I find that the reader really doesn't necessarily. And every every author has a different style. Sure. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know enough about wardrobe that me describing the uniforms that characters are wearing is going to be that compelling. Uh, uh, you are going to be more interested in what my characters are saying and doing. And, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, how, how many characters do we know what color their eyes are just off the top of their, our heads, you know, That's a good point. Uh, that tends to be the sort of thing that they always drop that in there everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, his blue eyes uh, darted from room to room, you know, right. it, it, well, you know, it's it's d d does it make the story any better to know that or you know, are, are we less in connection with that character, uh, you know, for not knowing it? When we did uh, A New Dawn, uh, you know, sort of the the first book in the, the new era of storytelling at oh, yes. uh, at, uh, at Star Wars, um, you know, 
there were some sequences with aliens where I didn't even tell you the species. It's true. I noticed that. And and, and I didn't even tell you the species because um, in many cases, uh, you know, the species that we had chosen were ones that had never been mentioned by name in the movies. Right. Uh, and so we didn't want to get things complicated by having to drop everything uh, and say – Oh, by the way, this person is a Rodian, uh, uh, and the Rodians are the you know whatever uh, the, you know the, the, the green snout mouth guys uh, like Greedo. Right. Uh, that would be fine if I was going to then talk about Rodians, but if I'm just having a couple of characters you know dueling, it might not be that important. Absolutely. Um, and you know if you're going to do a deeper dive into that character's life, sure. Um, but. You know, any one of these novels, you're going to have, you know, 10, 15, you know, characters with major speaking roles and then, you know, 50 other people. Uh, and how much do we really need to know? Um, you know, that's that's w been one of the occupational hazards uh, when I've been writing Star Trek uh, is that, you know, I'm I'm writing on, you know, these ships that have uh, lots and lots of crew members uh, and, their species are already determined by other authors. Uh, their uh, their ranks are already determined. Uh, genders, all sorts of other things, are already figured out. Right. Uh, and so I I actually have to work from a spreadsheet to make sure that it's 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 all correct. Um, and uh, you know I, I fortunately there haven't been uh, many errors in the the prey trilogy that uh, is is out now. Uh, but I can tell you a couple of them are indeed that where I just got the ranks wrong. <laughs> That's okay. George R. R. Martin, like, changed the sex of a horse, and everyone uh, caught it. Well, you know, one of the nice things about Prey, and I, I guess I'll talk about that for a few minutes here. Prey is this, uh, P-R-E-Y, as in Birds of Prey. It's a it's a trilogy that I wrote for the 50th anniversary. Uh, it's been releasing monthly. Uh, the third book uh, comes out uh, November 29th. Uh, and actually begins to – it's probably on shelves starting about right now anyway sure. uh, when, we're, when we're recording this. Uh, but it is uh, – it, it, it covers 100 years of the Federation's relationship with the Klingon Empire, uh, and it follows what happens to uh, the heirs of Commander Krug. And Commander Krug was the, uh, the, the Christopher Lloyd character in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. Right. He was the guy – he was the guy that screamed, "Give me Genesis!" Yes. And he, yeah, and he and he goes plummeting into a, a big lava ocean. Uh, well, he had a very powerful uh, you know, family business, uh, and one of the things that they did is they they manufactured these birds of prey, which remain one of my favorite starship you know, uh, uh, configurations sure. uh, from all of science fiction. Uh, and and so uh, you know this this uh, this storyline. Uh, uh, takes in a hundred years and uh, it, 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 uh, it, uh, so we have, uh, you know, the ramifications of what happens then impact Kirk and his era. And then they go on to become a problem for, uh, for Riker and uh, Picard uh, in their era. Uh, and so, and so that's, that's what's going on. And, uh, and, and what, what brings me back to, you know, why I started to mention this is mm -hmm. that, uh, even though the, these novels are releasing monthly, I wrote them over the course of a year, and so right. I would I completed one novel, turned it in, completed the second novel, and turned it in. Uh, but what was happening was uh, I was able to, uh, for a good long stretch of the summer, I had all three books back on my desk at once at, at different stages of proofreading, right. and that was excellent because I was able to go through and make sure. Uh, as you were mentioning Martin and the horse, right? Um, I was able to make sure that characters that I introduced in book one uh, did not suddenly, uh, you know, change ranks uh, sure. from book one to book three. Or, you know, I didn't mention that somebody was an only child in book one and suddenly he's got brothers in book three. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the, the spellings of names were all consistent. Uh, and most importantly, the new Klingon words that we coined were spelled the same way everywhere. So uh, <laughs> so so that was uh, that was you know, it's a rare opportunity because normally uh, you know, a novel trilogy, you're going to release it a book a year. Right. Um, and there's no option to go back and catch stuff. 
when when you when you got the project, did you know it was going to be a trilogy right off the bat, or how how do you know when? Oh yeah, was going oh yeah, I I I asked for it. Uh, you know the, um, I had this notion, and it was going to be a big sprawling epic, uh, that would basically present the next generation era with uh, their own crisis on the level of Star Trek VI: The Undiscovered Country. Right. You know where where there's this this incident that the Federation is blamed for that sends shockwaves everywhere. Uh, literal shockwaves appear in the actual movie. So, so uh, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do this, and I knew that it was too big for a single book because I wanted right. to show how it affected uh, characters everywhere uh, in the galaxy over the course of the period. And the other thing that was great is they gave me three months of story time um, you know, they have their own timeline that they're advancing forward a bit at a time. Okay. Uh, and they gave me three months. Basically, I have the spring of 2386, uh, where, you know, if you're reading the novels as they come out, uh, you're actually experiencing it as the characters would experience it. You'll be thinking back to two months ago uh, when you're reading the third book, and that will literally be two months ago for the characters. That is so cool. And, you know, it'll never feel like that again because when people will be reading it they'll be reading it in one sitting or something like that of course but uh but that's one of the cool things that that's uh that's that's available you know now uh and uh and again so i suggested hey i need i need i'd like to do a i i i'd like to do a trilogy and uh they said yes and you know then of course uh, the panic ensued because i realized <laughs> it was far bigger than anything i had ever done right. um and because it, it works out to be you know short just short of a third of a million words, wow. uh, and uh, you know I, I spent last summer uh, pretty much almost in a fetal position trying to figure <laughs> out how how in the world because I had so many story threads going in this thing and I didn't know you know it, it, this stuff doesn't really come together until you start writing and so I was it, it was it was intimidating and you know the only solution is to just get down and write. And so, you know, by the end of the, uh, you know, by the end of the first novel, uh, you know, I was no longer, you know, having the panic attacks. Uh, by the end of the second novel, I could, I could actually see, yeah, here's how this thing could actually work. Uh, and then we stuck the landing, and that makes me really happy. Uh, the, the, I'm, I'm delighted with how this series came out. Um, you know, I think it is one of the best things I've ever written. Um, yeah, the way that I characterize, uh, you know, sort of the other works that I've done, Knights of the Old Republic was the longest thing I ever wrote, uh, but the but the execution wasn't perfect because there were things you know beyond my control uh, and you know changes with artists and that sort of thing that uh, that just happened and and you know uh, uh, audibles that were kind of called at the uh, at the line of scrimmage uh, so that we could add things like vector and various other things. Uh, but that was the longest thing I ever did, and I'm proud of that. Uh, Kenobi is probably the thing I did where the execution was flawless throughout in the sense that I wouldn't change a word. Everything I intended to do uh, made it to the page, and you know, I don't have any regrets about it uh, at all uh, in, terms of, in terms of what we did. Uh, but it wasn't very long. I mean, it's, it's a single novel. Right. Uh, this experience on Prey gave me a chance to do both at the same time, which is uh, take the time to do something that is imagined from the beginning in one piece uh, and where I was able to kind of control it all the way and make it look like it, the way I wanted. Uh, would I change anything? Yeah, I would I would you know catch a couple of the errors that still did get through. Uh, and, and in fact, we have caught them and they've been fixed in the ebook already. Uh, so, <laughs> That's awesome. And and when we and when we're talking uh, you know errors, it's stuff that ninety nine percent of the people who read won't notice because it's it's somebody who you know was promoted from uh, ensign to lieutenant uh, seventeen books ago, right. uh, and you know, unless you actually have read them all, you're not going to know. Right, right. But that's like you know any artist when they create something, they're like no one else sees it, but I do. That's how, yeah. That's funny that you went back. That's amazing. Uh, Kenobi. Kenobi is the one thing that like a majority of Star Wars fans have always wanted told that that section that you tackled and I yeah. I got to thank you up front Qui-Gon is my favorite Star Wars character like yeah. I, I got of all of them so if he's in anything I'm like 
he, he's back. You did it. And that book you did so well. Having it like be the suspenseful thing where you're waiting for it to happen the whole time. And it was it was so good. And the I just I I love it. You did great. You did an amazing yeah. job telling that story that, you know, Jedi who uh, well, it's sort of the wait, w- w- sort of waiting for Godot, or yeah. you know, waiting for Gu- waiting for Guffman, except you know, it's waiting for Qui Gon. That's right. Uh, <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> um, you know, and I won't say how it ends, but you can imagine how the other two ended. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, the whole idea was I wanted to, you know, show him coming to grips with the fact that okay, this is my life. Right. Um, you know, this is this is uh, this could be. He he doesn't know. Whether you know we 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 you know in 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 our real world we deal with you know, you know political elections and we deal with job changes and we deal with uh, you know health issues and whatever sure. and we we don't always know whether a change in our lives is going to be for a day a week or for the rest of our lives sure with him it literally becomes the rest of his life and and you know it. Uh, you know, I'll tell you pretty much if I had my way, he would never leave Tatooine again, except, you know, to go uh, to to all around. Sure. Uh, and, and, but obviously, you know, we'll see if that if that uh, if that holds up or not. Right. Uh, but uh, if they decide to do anything else with it. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to show him coming to terms with the fact that, OK, yeah, this is what I signed up for. I better get down to it. Right. And, that includes deciding that he cannot have the life of a Jedi, uh, you know, helping people, saving people. Yeah. It also it also means he has to decide, you know, what I I, I can't have a uh, 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 you know wife and family or any other kind of a life than than uh, than he's you know than he ends up having. Right. Uh, and, you know that was that was always part of this all the way back into the very beginning and again on my website there's a long essay about how this thing started seven years earlier right. um, back in back 10 years ago uh, 2006 it started as a graphic novel idea and um, you know I realized it would work better in prose and then I had to wait five years to get the chance to write it so um, right yeah you know, save all your ideas yeah <laughs> <laughs> I just love the idea that you tackled the fact that Obi-Wan is like trained his whole life to be this Jedi, so he naturally wants to help people. And when they're killed off in Order 66, like he can't. And to have that struggle, it was great. I could talk all day. You did such a good job with that book. Well, um, I appreciate it. And, you know, I, I feel that, as I say, I, everything came off perfectly. Uh, you know, when the, uh, you know, when, when, when the, when the, you know, my editors and Lucasfilm, when they made suggestions, uh, they, wound up all being great perfect helpful things that help the story right uh you know the the idea of uh the meditation there was going to be one meditation in the beginning mm-hmm. uh you know uh jennifer heddle at lucasfilm said hey let's do let's do a lot of them right. uh and and i realized hey you know that's perfect because that that allows him to think out loud for the reader because the reader already knows what's happened sure uh, it's everybody else that's in the dark right but so we needed we needed Obi Wan. Obi Wan's try. You know, we see Obi Wan talking to Qui Gon, but he's really talking to the reader because we're the ones who know. Um, so so we have that, uh, and you know also uh, you know it was it was uh, you know the folks at Del Rey that suggested uh, doing um, as the prologue what I had been planning on doing as the uh, the story for Insider. Uh, right. uh, the, the, the prologue was originally going to be the insider, um, uh, short story. Oh, okay. Uh, and they said, no, we ought to get Obi-Wan into this book sooner because he appears on page 60 and that's probably beyond what people are going to be willing to accept. Right. And, you know, I, I was fine with it because again, the way that I handled it was in, you know, it was in keeping with the rest of the book. He was he was through we were we saw him through somebody else's eyes and and we got our first uh, meditation out of that too and that was that was absolutely fine that made perfect sense they also suggested uh, there was a duel at the end where he actually uh, you know, is, is 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 fighting the the crate dragon you know that again is something that was suggested that 
hey, you know what? It would be good to pay off all these crate dragon calls we've done all throughout this book. Right. Uh, and again, perfect idea. Uh, you know, when you know when it, when changes come in, you, you'll you'll see you'll see these requests, and they'll make you hide under your desk sometime <laughs> because you'll. You say, hey, no, what I wrote was perfect. What, what, you're making me change? No, no. But ultimately, ultimately, it usually is just a matter of, you know, I need to take 30 minutes and think through what I can do to, uh, you know, to address these concerns. Sure. Uh, and usually it comes out better. Right, absolutely. And then with, uh, you know, Lucasfilm, changing everything up to where now everything is canon and it all ties in we have the story group there you kicked off the new era with a new dawn yeah. which was great thank you for count vidian such a oh, fun, yeah. such a fun character um i a uh, question about that have you listened to the audiobook oh yeah uh, I, they did the, one such the, a good job one of, the, one of the jokes i say is that vidian's voice kind of you know scares my cat off the couch you know <laughs> whenever it comes on um yeah and i and i like the fact that that vidian uh, Vidian's internal dialogue uh, has a different sound to it. It's, it's the sound he hears in his own head. Right, right. Uh, and and so yeah, I, I think that that's uh, and and that internal dialogue voice is actually, uh, as I put it, that's the voice that he uses in his uh, in his motivational holograms. Yes, it was like a uh, pre-recording of like build bridges, move forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what what he what he does, you know. He's able to adjust his, uh, you know, he, what he does or what he says right. uh, for various audiences. And you know, when he's in his in his working role, his whole thing is he's trying to scare the heck out of people, and so right. uh, he he uses that other uh, that other sound. For sure, it it's so good. Um, in that, uh, how did how did New Dawn come about? Because it's it's Kanan and Hera. And yeah. like rebels is a big thing. Like, did you seek out and be like, I have this story, or did they have like a list and be like, we want you to write this story? All right. No, yeah, that, that that came from the other direction. Whereas Kenobi was all my you know notion. Uh, yeah, I was actually you know signing Kenobi for uh, Del Rey at uh, New York Comic Con. Uh, met with the editors and uh, I said uh, basically, what's 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 coming along here? Uh, and they they knew that they had two villain centric books that were in the works. Uh, one was Tarkin. Mm -hmm. Another was uh, lo the book that would become Lords of the Sith. Right. Uh, and they wanted a heroic book. And they also, uh, you know, there was a desire at, uh, at Lucasfilm to get a novel that tied into rebels. Right. Um, and again, they didn't have anything for rebels yet. It was actually at that event that they did the first rebels, uh, you know, screener uh, or, or it wasn't even really a screener. It was a, it was a panel where they had, yeah, some visuals, um, and uh, and you know, I said, uh, you know, I I could uh, I could pitch for this, sure, um, and uh, because it was it was going to be a matter of uh, simply, I would need to get enough information from Lucasfilm about the the series, uh, right. and some 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 suggestions from them as to when to set the thing, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, you know, we ended up going through four or five different uh, drafts of the plot. Um, you know, and, and so this takes us back about, uh, you know, three years ago this time, right. uh, where I was, uh, you know, in the at, at this at this point in time, I was uh, waiting to get a, a you know a conference call lined up uh, to talk with uh, Dave Filoni and the rest of the folks. Uh, to get a better handle on what they were looking for, mm -hmm. uh, because you know I uh, the the guts of the novel that eventually came out uh, were mostly there. Uh, you know the the planet of Gorse and right. uh, you know the our hero being some kind of a truck driver was always yeah. <laughs> there. Um, however, you know, it, in the beginning, it wasn't Kanan as the hero. It was a different character, and Kanan was uh, sort of the the person that he runs into. And and then I realized, okay, no, he should be the he should be the main character. Uh, and uh, again, I'm always cautious about that because I, I you never know when you're starting. Well, how much of this character can you expose? How much of this character can you use right. without getting into trouble? And so. Yeah, in my first draft, uh, Kanan and Hera are both side characters. 
uh, and, you know, maybe the second most and third most important character, but that's that's what they were. Um, and what they said is, no, here's what you do. You can we can we can make Kanan an open book right. without saying what he did before now. Right. Uh, and we can also, you know, and we can use Hera, but we will, Hera will be close close mouth. We will we will rarely be in Hera's mind, and when we are in Hera's mind, uh, you know she has no reason to think about her history and her uh, her family and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, at this point, and so you know, I, uh, I I think one of the critiques of the book was we don't get to see enough about enough of Hera's inner life. Well, that's by design. And then Rebels explored that, you know, just this past season as well. They went there, so that's that's very neat. Um. What are the biggest differences working on Star Wars now with the story group and like now that it has to be canon? Like between Kenobi and A New Dawn, obviously Kenobi was your story, but is there anything else now where like you have to check and send it in to make sure it coincides with everything or how exactly well, well, does it work? You always had to send things in to see if it coincided sure, uh, sure. at every stage of the way. This, however, you know, is something where it actually works both ways in the sense that they're able to send you stuff and say, here, here, this is coming up. Maybe you can you know, drop hints about this or whatever. Oh, okay. And and that is what happened, because obviously we foreshadow a number of things uh, in Rebels right. uh, in uh, in uh, in a new dawn. Uh, but again, we, we were doing that to a degree before that. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that happened uh, in between uh, drafts of the graphic novel version of Kenobi uh, Mm -hmm. was that Lucasfilm let me know that, hey, uh, John Ostrander is going to bring back uh, Sherrod Het. Right. uh, Or or, or actually it was Asherrod Het. Yeah. um, uh, In uh, in Legacy. And so there's going to be a Kenobi moment over there. And you need to decide where your story is in relation to that and whether you use it. And as you ultimately saw with Kenobi, I did use it. Right. Uh, but I, I, I used part of that storyline. Uh, I, I might not have even gone there otherwise. Gotcha. Uh, but so that was a that was, again, a case where a suggestion came from them. Uh, it was really more of a suggestion of here's a roadblock to avoid. Right. Uh, you know, gave me uh, a story opportunity. Gotcha. That's yeah. That's one of my biggest questions I have with like Star Wars authors specifically. You know, you, Paul S. Kim, James Luceno, like all of you guys, is now with the story group because you can't write something that would uh, go against something that we know now that it's all tied together. So it's pretty amazing that you have that sort of uh, creative liberties, but also fits in. You know, hinting at Hera's backstory, but not really giving any of away. That's fascinating. You're a New York Times best-selling author. Yeah, that uh, that actually came first from um, Knight Errant, I think, How? and uh, that was that was my first novel. That we we wound up uh, uh, somewhere near the bottom of the the paperback list. Right. Um, that was back when paperbacks still sold enough that actually they would land there. Um, you know, the, the there are now you know uh, so many James Patterson novels and everything. <laughs> that these lists are harder and harder to get on. Um, right. Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, that got on there, and then uh, yeah, I think the second time I got on there was for my first Mass Effect graphic novel, right? Uh, where, where I think we came in number two, uh, which was cool, and then Kenobi, uh, and uh, you know the uh, the you know the uh, I, I'm I'm going to be looking at the list probably next, uh, you know when uh, when the Halo uh, hardcover comes out right. uh, in the mass market because. Uh, you know, the hardcover graphic novels, that's, again, I run this website where I have, a, you know, sales charts. Sure. And so I have, I have a sense of where the threshold is to get on some of these charts. So, you know, I, I'm not sure what the Halo book will do, but, uh, but that one I'll at least look, you know, some of the other books, you, you just know right off the bat, uh, you know, the threshold is just way too high. Right. Um, for certain kinds of genre books to make it. It's it's I got to say it's pretty great to go to hear of someone as a kid loving comics and grow up with them to being on a chart. That's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. So congrats yeah, on that. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, you know it's uh, it, it's cool. It's you know it's also a job. I mean one of the Absolutely. one of the challenges one of the challenges now is you know while I was away writing all these Star Trek novels, I didn't actually 
you know, spend a lot of time pitching my next thing. So, sure, sure. Uh, so I, you know, I have I have a number of uh, uh, plates that I'm starting to spin again, but uh, uh, really, I needed a break. Right. And right. Uh, and I, I've I've had that. So that is awesome. Um, I have a, a couple writers that listen to my podcast. Do you have any advice for them? Like- well, write write whatever you can. I mean, write always for an audience. Uh, nobody is ever going to see something you never let out of the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I would be looking for places where you can write to be seen. Fan fiction is is one of those places where you can write for practice to have other people read your material. Right. Don't pretend that you'll ever sell it. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it it's, your fan fiction will not get you a job writing in the franchise you were in. Doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, there's just legally that we can't look at it. Uh, the people that that do these things, you know, it's all invitation only. You have to come from a different. Uh, you have to you have to have come from writing something else. They must know you from writing something else. Gotcha. Um, and and so that means you need to be writing in other places where people can see you. Uh, and you know, it really doesn't matter what you write. Uh, you know, you could be writing articles uh, on you know high school basketball games for the local newspaper. It gets you accustomed to hitting deadlines and writing for people who uh, will read your work and provide feedback. Uh, it also gets you accustomed to the notion that you really should be writing for people to give you money. Right. <laughs> uh, and and you know to, to to take yourself seriously and to take your work seriously, you've got to look at it as a paying gig. Sure. Uh, and and so you you need to look for customers. There are all sorts of people that that uh, you know. Uh, got in in various different ways uh you know obviously the way that i discussed that i came into this business uh it does not exist anymore in in a lot of ways sure uh, and so uh you know, i think that that uh uh you know it, it's look at other authors find out how they did it uh and you will almost always find out that they uh you know were either journalists uh, or or something else in their own right uh, first. You know, Christy Golden, she worked for the editorial page of USA Today. Uh, right. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jason Fry. Uh, you know, I think he's he worked as a sports writer. Right. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of a lot of other folks that you know they came working for other things. I worked for business magazines. Uh, they just have to be business magazines in in the comics business. Uh, so uh, you know, so that that kind of helps, but. Uh, yeah, always look for opportunities to write where other people will read your work. That is awesome. That is great advice. Well, I have taken up over an hour of your time. Thank you oh, so, so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, happy to. And uh, folks can find uh, me on uh, on the line at uh, JJM Far Away on Twitter. Perfect. Uh, they can they can find me at uh, farawaypress.com on uh, on my website. Uh, and in the bookstores, uh, I think I have like eight or nine books out this fall <laughs> uh, because there is uh, uh, the Star Trek uh, Prey trilogy. Uh, book one and two are already out. Book three uh, is out at the end of November. This thing is still rocking something like five stars on Amazon, in the first two chapters. So uh, a lot of people, even who don't read Star Trek, are digging it. Uh, uh, then we've got, uh, I've got two Halo books out, uh, Halo, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Tales from Slip Space is the hardcover graphic novel anthology that I'm in. That's out from Dark Horse just now in comic shops. Uh, also Halo Frontiers, which is uh, a prose anthology that has a number of other Star Wars authors in it. Uh, I know that Troy Denning is uh, in there, I believe, oh, cool. uh, as is Christy Golden. Uh, so, uh, that is out from, uh, from Simon and Schuster. Uh, so that's five books. They, Dark Horse just released the Mass Effect Omnibus, which puts my first three Mass Effect books all together, uh, in one cover that came out this last week as well. Uh, I have a Planet of the Apes short story, uh, that's out in, uh, Planet of the Apes Tales from the Forbidden Zone. And that comes out in January. Uh, in March, we've got uh, the uh, reprint uh, I had mentioned before of Knights of the Old Republic, uh, the second third of the series. That's the epic collection from Marvel. 
Uh, and I think there's even a collection coming out around Christmas uh, having to do with a video game comic I work for called Smite. So that's that's nine books in the next <laughs> it's like a six-month period. So this is why I took a few months off. Yeah, I do not blame you whatsoever. Uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Um, you're also going to be at Paradise City Comic Con in Miami yeah, if anybody's going to be there. Yes, Fort yeah, Lauderdale. Fort, you're right. Yeah, for I I, 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 I was scared. <laughs> I, I, I was scared when you said Miami because yeah. I'm like, you know, I just I just got my plane ticket the yes, yesterday, so yeah. it's. Uh... <laughs> You're right. It, it's been in Miami the last three years. They just moved it. Oh, has it? Yeah. Okay. Well, that, Fort that's. Uh, okay. Well, yes. I will. Uh, I'll be there signing for uh, Wordfire Press, which is Kevin Anderson. There's another Star Wars name. Kevin Anderson has a a a booth that uh, has multiple different authors working on it. Uh, I'm going to be sort of their headline uh, act there, so. Uh, they haven't told me yet uh, about panels or anything, but uh, I would expect I'd be doing something like that as well. Awesome. I'll see you there. Sounds good. But, uh, yeah, thank you again. It's It's been great. I really, really yep. appreciate your time. I enjoyed it. All right. All right. 